process of examination, which is, I think, what is the primary mechanism in the coach wins compromise, is acute. I don't think you can catch it. And the question is, does the transfusion actually improve the outcome? In other words, are you potentially surviving a baby that should, in and of its own right, expire because it has such a major insult to its brain? We've elected not to transfuse these, and I think the literature supports the fact that the prognosis, if you're hit, you're hit hard and, and your outcome is bad. And to do an intervention, I think, gives false hopes. When we've presented this information to our patients, they have declined the transfusions. So we don't transfuse for an acute demise. And like Dr. Gutakis, I've never seen one happen before my eye. I and mean, we've seen them going down in the process of, uh, we've had twin cases where we're starting a laser where you have a profoundly hydroptic recipient that simply anesthesia puts this fetus over the edge. It gets into an agonal heart rate, and a quick acute cord occlusion can save the donor. But I've never seen one where it died, and then you were able to, I mean, think about putting a transfusion together. You, you don't put them together in 15 minutes. They take hours. You've got to get blood ready. You've got to get the patient to the OR. It's, don't do it. Um, this presentation is always um, interesting to do in a situation where you're in a country where uh, options, pregnancy termination is, is restricted. Um, and it's even more interesting when you give it in the U.S. where every state has different rules and regulations in the context of what, when termination is or isn't available. Um, some of the suggestions earlier by Dr. Gritakos that you do the right thing by the patient in the U.S. can get you in prison. The right thing may be to try and save one fetus where you have a profoundly growth restricted coach twin that's dying and if I let that fetus die, that means the normal twin is going to have a major insult but it's after 25 weeks in Texas, I would be arrested. So I have the choice of watching, okay, her die, the, the fetus die, I have the choice of delivering knowing the 25 weeker will do very poorly, all right or I will send her to Colorado where the law says 32 weeks and explain that one to me. It, it's just, it's archaic. So anyway, um, this, there we go. Um, this is a case actually was sent to us from New Jersey. This is a young couple. Uh, she is 23, he's 25, he's holding down two jobs. Both grandparents are with them in the same house and they go to have this ultrasound. And lo and behold, they've got twins and it's, Oh my gosh, you know, what's going to happen? And this is kind of where her head goes, you know, um, all excited about what's going to happen, bigger house, bigger home. And unfortunately, when she has an 18-week ultrasound, she finds that twin A is normal, but twin B has ventricular megaly. And by the time she sent to us two weeks later, where you're looking at a ventricles that are 1.8 uh, centimeters, she got tested with 2.5, massive ventricular megaly. And in the context of, of this, this is not an exception in, this, in these twins, monochorine twins. Quite frankly, we see a number of malformations. Now, a couple of things I'm going to be talking about here, twin twin, excuse me, twin reverse arterial perfusion, quite frankly, is the earliest form of twin twin transfusion and has its own set, okay, of risk factors for the co-twin. Discordant malformations, you can see structural malformations. Um, and how can that be? These are identical twins. Quite frankly, it's very common to see this. Or chromosome abnormalities, that's always the good one, and we've just heard about discordant growth. Okay, so a diagnosis here. Trap. 
as I said. It happens about 1 in 3,500 to 1 in 3,000 pregnancies. I'm sorry, 1 in 35,000 pregnancies. Um, it's the earliest form of 2 to 1 transfusion syndrome. It's a reverse arterial perfusion. Quite often, what will happen is the cord of the co-twin inserts directly into the cord of the, of the pump twin. And what you have is a reverse process that literally at four to five weeks destroys the heart, if you will. All right? And now what you have is an appendage to the co-twin. And again, part of the politics and things in the U.S., this is called t reverse twin arterial perfusion. Now those of us in the audience know that this acardiac mass is a tumor. It's a teratoma to the co-twin. Try explaining that to a medical director in the U.S. whose background is internal medicine, and here's the word twin. And we talk about stopping the blood flow, and he says that's a termination and we don't pay for terminations. And I'm saying no. And two hours later, realizing I'm not getting anywhere, we said we'll just do it for free because it's not worth the headache to go through this process. The code twin, though, the pump is not without its own set of risks. One need watch closely to see what's going on. Again, another cardiovascular disease. Perinatal mortality here is in excess of 50%. Again, the process here, the reverse perfusion, what actually happens, we're not quite sure, okay? But we do feel it's a pressure phenomenon that simply destroys the heart early on so that the acardiac becomes a tumor, if you will, a pump, a bypass for high output failure in the pump twin. What you're looking at here is the pump to the left and to the right is the acardiac, and this is actually the cord coming in, inserting directly into the placental insertion of the pump twin. Here's a case where this is the cranium, and this is the scalp edema. This pregnancy actually at eight weeks we were called and said that they thought they had a vanishing twin. And when they did the 18-week ultrasound, Jason had returned. This is the pump twin. This is the acardiac abdominal area, if you will, massive in 18 weeks. And what we know from some work from Tom Moore is that the relationship between the size of the pump and the size of the acardiac, the larger the, the acardiac gets, the greater the risk is overall for things like hydramnios, uh, preterm delivery, etc. Our bias is at this point in time, if it continues to grow, it's going to be an issue, and 50, greater than 50% is probably a cut point. Prognostic markers. There's been some work done looking at umbilical artery, postility index, and reverse uh, and RI as well, but the reality is the numbers are so small, it's really hard to utilize that information in such a rare disease. We again default to the cardiac function of the pump twin, and also if the pump, if the acardiac is continues to grow. So if you start seeing signs of cardiac failure in the pump twin, you know to move in. But we would argue even in the presence of hydramnios, probably there's an argument to be thinking about moving ahead. Again, this is a pregnancy that requires close observation and seeing what's going on. This is not one you can walk away from. You're going to want to look as far as the heart. You're going to want to look at ductal blood flows in the pump twin, specifically the ductus venosus, the umbilical vein, and middle cerebral artery as well to help us understand what's going on. This is the algorithm that we would follow and recommend that you see. If it's less than 50% ratio between size, okay, and no sign of cardiac failure, just continue to watch and observe. If it's greater than 50%, receive cardiac decompensation, intervene. Quite frankly, if we continue to see it grow, we will actually argue, even if it's less than the 50th percentile, that probably there's something to be done here because what can happen is when you get past 20 weeks, there can be an acceleratory growth in the acardiac twin. Discordant malformations. Now, we know they increase in monozygotic twins over dizygotic and over singletons. Point in fact, the risk of cardiac malformations in monozygotic twins is ninefold that which you see in singletons. All monochorionic monozygotic twins warrant fetal echo to see what's going on as part of the evaluation in 18 to 20 weeks. The issue is concordancy is rare. So seeing one with a Hypoplastic left heart doesn't necessarily mean because we're identical that I'm going to see it in the co-twin, but you need to evaluate. What about chromosome abnormalities? Discordant karyotypes, heterokaryotic twin, I won't say it's common, but it's the most frequent where we see a situation where you see a massively hydroptic fetus at 18 weeks, and the co-twin is perfectly normal. You sample the hydrops, you find Turner syndrome, 25X, and on the co-twin you see 46XX, everything's fine, all right? Or you see a situation where you have Down syndrome in one, and the other one's perfectly normal. You come in and one fetus has a sign on it that says I have trisomy 18 because every malformation you could possibly see is present and the co-twin is normal, but they both have trisomy 18. 
Same thing's been reported for trisomy 13. What's going on? Well, in the first two cases, it's anaphase lag or trisomic rescue. In the second two situations, it's a penetrance issue. The point being, when you see discordant monochorionic dianoid twins, you're advised to sample both. And if you're considering a selective reduction in some form for the anomalous one, sample the normal one. You want to make sure if you're going to reduce, you're leaving a normal baby. We know when we see anomalous versus normal twins in control population, the anomalous fetus is at increased risk for poor outcome, either fetal or neonatal death. And that, if it's a fetal situation, puts the co-twin at risk. We discussed that earlier in the context of twin to twin. The risk does not appear to be as great in monochromic twins in the absence of twin to twin transfusion syndrome, but it is still very real. The old acronym said that, well, it's a situation where we're thrombotic events going on. Actually, it's most likely a hemodynamic process. As we said a second ago, in the presence of an acute loss, what do you do? In this situation, what you'll see in the absence of twin to twin, some of between 12 to 20 percent will result in the death of the co-twin, and again, about 15 to 20 percent will result in significant neurologic compromise in monochorionic twins in the absence of twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Predictive for, uh, predictions as far as survival in co-twin with IUFD, not twin-twin, not IUFD, but actually gestational age of the IUFD. The prognosis, if the demise is before 13 weeks, is good for the co-twin. But when you're looking at second and third trimester losses, that risk to the co-twin is somewhere in the order of 20 to 30 percent, as I said a second ago. And what gets hit? Neurologically, but also you'll see situations where you can have bowel infarction, you can see renal abnormalities, pulmonary abnormalities, but about 17% will be immune in all respects. So it's been suggested in view of the deteriorous effects of vascular disruption in the surviving trend, if a monozygotic twin is strongly suspected, delivery should be undertaken as soon as possible if the co-twin is of sufficient maturity. The problem is, many times, it's preterm. So what do we do? Do we sit and watch and wait and sort of get your hair grayer and wondering what's going to happen here? Or do you consider intervention? The interventions are not benign. There are risks. There's also the moral issues associated with that. Laser can separate them, dichorionize, okay, that can allow one fetus, you survive, you survive, you don't, you don't. But then again, are you leaving a baby behind that will be delivered that will cause significant hardship on the family as well? There are a number of reports done that show in the presence of an anomalous fetus or severely growth restricted fetus that's hospitalized for an extended stay in a normal twin, it's very disruptive to the family unit. Again, a process that can result in separation, significant financial hardship, and things of that sort. It's been suggested by Bernisky that it may be justified to consider litigation, uh, ligation, excuse me, not litigation, ligation, of one of the umbilical cords when the early recognition of twin to twin transfusion syndrome is seen because of the poor outcome. Now this is stated in 67. This slide is for historic purposes only. The last time that a hysterotomy was done for a selective reduction was in 1996 at UCSF. In this particular case it was done in 1989 and the operator did hysterotomy and you can see the ligation of the cord right there of the donor twin. Unfortunately he went right through the placenta when he did it and cause exsanguination of both. So obviously not something that we want to do. Techniques and interventions. Well, thrombogenic substances have been used, coils, pharmaceutical agents such as alcohol or gels. No one's using those now. There's a very high incidence of failure and subsequent co-twin demise on the order of 50%. Ligation, one center has talked about this, but quite frankly, again, the use of ligation, probably the only place for that is going to be in late terminations when you have a situation, you have a very large umbilical cord that you can't get around, right? But the reality is, again, very few centers have any experience with this particular technique. The majority of the work has been with interstitial umbilical cord occlusions, either intra-abdominal or at the cord itself, and, a, and bipolar cord uh, coagulation. This is kind of the paradigm people talk about, and what's the lower limit? I'll give you some information shortly that would suggest prior to 16 weeks probably is not a good idea to consider doing interventions because of risks there. And then we're talking about interstitial, it's either monopolar, laser, okay, or radio frequency ablation. Bipolar after 20 weeks. When you're looking at interstitial occlusion, 
The first work was done in the monopolar arena. That was done by Rodek back in the early 90s, um, looking at just sort of the overall setup. We actually do all the RFA. That's, that is our procedure of choice when we're doing interstitial. And the difference here, again, from a patient perspective, if you're looking at these, these are not large needles. These are actually outpatient procedures. The significant difference, though, in the context of this instrumentation, I've pointed out to the left with the radio frequency ablation. If you're doing the laser approach, most likely you have a laser unit in your hospital, so your cost there really isn't an issue, okay? Because it's, it's a needle, it's a laser fiber, and you have a unit. Radio frequency ablation is extremely expensive. The needle itself is $1,500. The pads are $500, so it's $2,000, non-reusable. The generator itself is $2,000. Most hospitals, large university centers, have a generator in their surgical unit. Your surgical oncologist is using this, so that's what you partner with them from, the, to, from a cost scenario. But when you look at the efficiency, what you may cost more is a more efficient procedure, and I'll show you that in a second. This is the original report by Charles Rodek, and they created a wire in-house for monopolar use to do radio frequency ablation. Others have used, I mean, there's, there's reports of telephone wire being used, okay? Anyway, any way you can get a monopolar effect through it, and what you're doing here is a percutaneous insertion into the umbilical vein and ablating that and stopping the flow process is, is the, the idea. Now, this is actually a case that we did using a laser occlusion technique, and what you're looking at is the tip of the needle coming down to actually the insertion site, and you can see cord behind us. Part of the process is getting that needle right where you want it and then delivering a laser fiber. What you're going to see in a section is an explosion, okay, it's sort of a change in the process as the energy is released from the laser fiber. Um, I'm sorry, this clip's a little bit longer than I anticipated, but the, the point to be made is that this is a divergent energy, okay, it's uncontrollable, so you don't know which way you're going. You're on target and you're hoping that when you put this wattage in there, that what you're going to, there you see, so it's just scattered. Okay, now granted, in a, in a trap situation, that's fine because that's a low flow process, all right? And when you come back and you look at it, you look and you see, we, we have successfully occluded. The problem when you try to use this technology as far as in other diseases than trap is that quite frankly, the high pressure in a divergent situation, you can't control your heat, you can't control your damage control. And when you look at the work that's been done with regard to laser ablation, what we see is that survival rates vary from 68% to 80% to these two reports. The Hamburg group had two failures using a laser approach, interstitial. The group from, from Queen Charlotte actually had a higher loss rate than what we see here, but they were also doing their procedures much earlier, as you can see, going down to as low as 11. An important thing to note is that within that particular population from the Queen Charlotte group, they had two cases of aplastic cutaneous congenita. And what that situation resulted in, in one baby requiring multiple skin grafts, whereas the, the, the top one showing you simply the knee injury. The process here, not knowing what, it, what actually is going on, there is a parallel between singleton intrauterine death early in gestation, where well, this has actually been reported as well. And the process seems to be similar to what we see when we see an unprotected demise, that there is a hypotensive event, and it seems to be related to early in gestation. These cases both are performed less than 16 weeks. This information, along with, again, the higher failure rate in the lower cases, has basically resulted in most centers saying that they're not going to do these procedures less than 16 weeks. Radiofrequency ablation. Note the difference in the needles now. This is actually a convergent heat. You have times that are actually pointing towards each other, sort of like a laser beam, if you will, coring it to a central point and trying to deliver its energy. This is the device, it's a 17 gauge needle, okay, again a single use needle. There's also a 14 gauge that we'll get if you have a larger situation. And again, deploying the tines to the targeted area. What we're doing here, again, this is in a, a trap situation. You're seeing a needle come in. You see flow coming, this is a, a, a velamentous insertion of the cord down to the pump twin. These procedures, roughly, when you're on target, take less than 10 minutes, quite frankly. Um, it's, a, it's a local anesthesia. Uh, with some IV sedation, and the, the tines will be deployed into the targeted area, and you'll see the hyperechoic hyper development going on here as the energy is being delivered. It's delivered at approximately 100 watts of energy, and you can see now that we've occluded this particular vessel.
This is the combined experience in the U.S. for the NAFNET. This is the North American Fetal Therapy Network. It's 20 centers in Canada and the U.S. that work collectively on evaluation of various therapies for in utero uh, intervention and also the natural history of fetal disease. Uh, the group, 98 cases, 81 were monochorionic, diamniotic, 6 were mono-mono, there were 3 triplet diachorionic triamnetics, and 6 triplet monochorionic triamniotic. We used either a 14 or a 17-gauge needle, interstitial ablation between 18 weeks was the diagnosis, and two weeks later was the treatment. 80% survival rate, and that survival rate was varied based on the number of cases that you had done. In centers that had done more than 10 cases, survival rate was in excess of 92%. In centers that have done less than 10, survival rate was sitting around 70-75%. Mean gestational age of delivery here was roughly 33 and a half weeks. There were two thermal burns early on in the experience. Again, these, this device generates a significant amount of heat. Uh, so the grounding pads actually, in this particular case, uh, were not well applied and there were two second degree burns. Premature rupture of membranes happened in 17 weeks prior to 30, in 17% prior to 30 weeks. What about using this device in non-trap situation? This is some of our experience at Baylor. We found that actually it, it works well. Okay, in those situations, we've used this in, in spina bifida cases, we've used it in encephaly, we've used this in selective growth restriction. Again, during about 20 weeks, mean gestational age is pretty comparable to what we saw with the others. Part of the problem with our delivery in gestational age, many of these cases return to the community from which they came. We don't have control of what's going on there. Uh, survival, again, 75% at this point in time. Actually, that number, I understand, is over 80% because three, these three pregnancies actually have on, that were ongoing have delivered now. Bipolar. Bipolar is probably the most commonly used device. All right? uh, this technology was, was originally reported in 2000 by Jan de Preston and a group from Leuven in 10 cases. The device at the top is the one that's the most often used. It's a three millimeter device. The two lower devices, uh, one actually has a blade in it that supposedly can be beneficial if, after occlusion to actually excise the cord. In a monoamniotic situation, it's argued that to avoid cord entanglement in a situation where you've, after the occlusion, to actually excise, I can tell you it doesn't work. Um, so <laughs> you get yourself sort of stuck inside with the cord occluded and now you're stuck on the device, it's, it's not good. The lower device, it looks like it actually would be much, uh, a much better device because it's smaller, smaller hole, less risk of problem. The problem with it is when you deploy the tines, you can't see them. There's, it's, so you're sort of groping in the dark. So actually, 97% of the work's been done with the device at the top. So what you see, as far as just image-wise, you see tines coming in, the forceps coming down to the cord. Oops, I'm sorry. Let's go back here for a second. Um, and as you grasp the cord, you're going to see boiling, we call it streaming, okay, of the Wharton's jelly, all right, around that cord. And what will happen is that will boil at such an intensity, you will hear an audible pop at the time. And actually, the first time you hear that happen, you just, you're stunned, like, what just happened? And the tendency is to let go. And that's absolutely the worst thing you can do, because now what you've done is you've let go. There's a good chance you've got a ruptured vessel that's not completely sealed. Uh, Umberto Nicolini had that unfortunate event happen one time and couldn't recover from it. Um, so if we just look in the situation here, this anencephalic, we've looked at the cord to see where we are to sort of get our angle of approach. And we have a, a three millimeter trocar in so we can take a look. And then we will apply the forceps coming in sonographically. And what we will do is we'll grasp it, drive it to the sidewall, but then pull back. Pull away from the myometrium, all right? and start applying the energy. Uh, the burn cycles are anywhere from 20 to 30 seconds with wattage anywhere from 30 to, to, to 60, depending on what you're going to do. And what you'll see, there's the streaming I'm talking about, all right? And that will go on. And when that dissipates and it's gone, you know that you've closed that segment. And this is what the cord will look like at completion. You see this very indented hyperechoic area right there, or some whited out area. All right, so the conclusion. Now, the thing to remember is that the cord does spiral, right? So you can't just grasp it in one site, right? And also the duration. At 18 seconds, we heard the audible pop. At 30 seconds, we continued on and grasped the cord in two different places. Histologically, if you look at the, on the left, we did nothing to the artery, okay, and partially occluded the vein at 18 seconds. All we did was disrupt the Wharton's jelly. On the right, 30 seconds, 
complied complete thermal burn to the proximal vessels, but notice the artery to the far left, that still was not included, the spiral. So you have to grasp the cord in at least two, if not three sites to assure that you've got complete occlusion. When you look at outcomes in these, there are three reports here, Louis, Robert, and myself. Um, our cases collectively at these various malformations, and this is a collage. This includes trap cases, this includes anencephalitis, this includes various malformations. So that, that this may not pertain per, per disorder, if you will. But overall, the mean gestational age of delivery here in this group is probably on the order of about 35 weeks. And if you look at survival rates, on the order of roughly 80% plus. Problem we all have is premature rupture membranes. And there's a clear correlation, okay, between the loss rate and the uh, long-term outcome and PROM. 24% is, is the lowest. We, we see PROM within 10 weeks of the procedure, excuse me, within four weeks of the procedure in 10% of cases, and we'll see 30% prior to 34 weeks. So it is still, still a major problem in all these interventions, and not just this, but laser, everything that we do. It was argued in 2000 that selective feticide is no different from death of a co-twin. Cord ligation will prevent loss of blood into the, to the dead the twin, the vascular compartment, but not into the placenta. And I thought about that and I said, you know, I'm not really sure that's, that's true. So I called Kurt Bernischke, who's one of the gurus of placental physiology, and Kurt said, no, that's just not true, okay? The amount of blood loss in the cotyledon mass is trivial and can't lead to hypotension that causes CNS damage in the survivor. So my thought is that ligation could be performed without risk to the survivor. Well, the proof's in the pudding. The work that Elizabeth Louis has shown us, okay, overall, is that about an 8% developmental delay in the bipolar group and survivors. And again, the relationship has to do with gestational age of delivery. The ones that were delayed delivered earlier and quite often were associated with premature rupture of membranes, all right? Survival overall, looking at this, vascular occlusion, they're effective therapies, they do work. Depending on the disease that you're looking at, RFA is actually a, a good modality, specifically when you're looking at TRAP because of low velocity. It may have some utility also in the context of other malformations. It has reduced maternal morbidity. Bipolar is a larger device, it's a three millimeter hole, has a greater risk of premature rupture membranes, but it's equally successful. I really don't think there's a role for laser at this point, definitely not a role for monopolar, all right? Ligation, as I said, is center specific. And when you're looking at laser, I think it's utility. Again, depending on the disease you're looking at, you need to be cautious, but we shouldn't be doing anything below 16 weeks. And the bottom line is we're in trouble all the way with regard to PROM. It remains our Achilles heel, as stated in 1996, beyond depressed. It is the one problem that we cannot seem to get our hands around. Once we've fixed the issue with the membranes, many of the interventions we talk about now will become commonplace, and other diseases that we might think not to go after, such as gastroschisis in utero, may truly be something that we can correct. Thanks again. Any questions?